Hello, hello, and welcome to Lawrence Plays Factorio Space Exploration with Crastorio 2, and to the combat ship, the Caladrian, which we've been using to go off and do some uh, do some damage. Now, I should probably warn you before I get too far into this stream that there's going to be a few spoilers in this one for some of the puzzles later on in space exploration. So, if you're just here because you're interested in the interburbulator, then jump forward to about 4 minutes and 27 seconds where I'll be starting to work talking about the puzzles there. However, if you want to jump past that bit because you're going to be doing these puzzles yourself later and you don't want spoilers, well, I'll tell you when once we've got a little bit closer before I say anything too spoilery to allow you to then jump forward to uh, to safer bits of the video. There'll also be some spoilers related to the archaeological victory a bit later on as well, but once again, I'll give you a bit of a warning about that. You can also see how everything's split up with the chapters on this video. So now I've touched on all of that, let's get started on what this video is actually all about, the things we got up to in the last stream. And so we flew over in the in the Caladrian to the planet of Anathema, which has, um, well it has the puzzle over here which I'm going to talk about later, but also there's quite a lot of biters on this planet. And this ship that we're on has been de designed very much as a drop ship that we can just land on a planet with and hopefully things will go fairly well. So we did this during the stream of course, but uh, let, let's let's repeat it now on in, in the video and see how things go. So we can, we can now try and land on the planet and I'll say yes I want to land here because you can't actually land on top of the biters, but you can land in amongst them like this. And so then up, the shields come up, the lasers all start firing, and uh, hopefully we'll now be able to work our way through the, through the fighters fairly quickly. We've also got a, um, an artillery system in the middle here that will deal with any, uh, any, any we'll, we'll start firing out and angering the biters, but also uh, discouraging them with a little bit of um, nuclear action like this. And so we can see that we do have we do have bots up here. In fact, let's switch over to the navsat mode because I can move the camera around more easily. We do have uh, some. We're taking some damage up at the top now. I thought we had robots on the ship and um, and uh, repair packs, but it doesn't seem. Oh yes, there, there's one flying around here trying to repair things and uh, and struggling a little bit. But the shields are quite good, as you can see down here. The shields are taking a lot of a beating from the uh, from all of these spitters, but they're blocking it. And whilst they're still taking damage from the acid being on them. They aren't doing too badly on the, on the damage front there, and we seem to be holding the biters off reasonably well. Now, the slight prop the slight risk here is that whilst we do have all of these defences, eventually we're going to start we're going to start pulling in these larger waves of biters, and it looks like there are a few gaps in the walls around the edge, which is a little bit unfortunate, and it's letting the an occasional biter through. However, the um, the, ver the nuclear artillery and the, and the various shots being fired by the uh, the lasers and the laser artilleries are making reasonably good work of the biters. There's been a little bit of destruction down in the corner here, and I think that was due to um, there was one of the uh, worms over here was able to spit through this gap in the in the uh, defences. So maybe I can go over here myself. I don't know if I've got any actual. I don't know if I've got any laser turrets I can use to repair that. I haven't even got any robots because I'm in my combat trousers. But uh, yes, the other thing we then did was wander outside and start using our own um, our own personal laser defences to deal with the abiters. Now, when we initially landed, I had my combat suit on, which because I designed it for taking on pyramids, did not have any jetpacks in it. I did fairly quickly change that and start putting more useful weapons in. But at the moment, I'm able to use my personal laser defences to rip through the biters. One thing you will notice is that my um, my energy, but my battery power down there in the bottom left corner has depleted incredibly quickly because I don't have that much power storage in my suit, and the lasers we're using are extremely powerful, and therefore they burn through the power very very quickly. However, they do all have their own internal batteries, and so I'm able to carry on taking out the biters for a little bit longer before I start to run out of uh, run out of power. Um, and hopefully this is going to be okay with this with this flood coming in. Anyway, this uh, this battle raged on for a while, and uh, with with four of us flying around, sort of dealing with the dealing with the biters that were lur uh, lurking around, we didn't have too much trouble dealing with them. And having and with the artillery in the middle, lobbing out these nukes all the time, and the, and the laser artillery as well, we were able to deal with the biters without too much difficulty. And eventually, we got to a point where the planet was reasonably uh, reasonably pacified. And at this point, we moved on to the reason we come over here. And this is the part that's actually going to be a bit spoilery if you want to look into the puzzles. And so, if you want to skip over this part, I'll completely understand. Jump forward to about 10 minutes and 36 seconds, and you can rejoin us for the less spoilery parts of the video. Once we'd finished um, pacifying the planet and clearing out the biters to a, a decent a decent perimeter, should we say, the next thing was to wander into this building over here where we found this uh, this friendly Spidertron called Bronchen, and he seems to be um, in charge of this game called inter called Interburbulation or something like that. So we you come over, so we came in here, we clicked on the uh, on the device down here, and we get this play into burble uh, option coming up. Now, how how can I arrange stuff so you can so you get a good view? Let's put that there and, and this here. 
And the way this game works is that you're shown you're shown a plane over here, and this is this is a, just a, a flat representation of it in in, in the in the side screen. Uh, and but you're told the vector coordinates of the top left, top right, and bottom left positions of it. So from that you can determine exactly where the plane is in 3D space. This plane is then split up into a grid, as you can see here, and it tells you the grid size. So this one is a four by four, as it shows there. And there is a target cell that is two across, three down. And so what it's asking you to find is the vector coordinates of a place inside that grid square. So we um, we spent a little bit of time staring at this and scratching our heads and uh, came up with uh, various different ways of solving it. So I started off with some of the easier puzzles, just sort of visualising it in my head and then trying to type it to find some numbers. But whilst it starts off with fairly easy puzzles like this one and this one, where the numbers are all nice and small and you can sort of work it out, you can sort of picture what's going on reasonably easily. Uh, by the time you get to the last level, the grid is much, much larger um, has much, much and has a much, much smaller target and the numbers you're playing with are much, much more difficult. And so at this point, both myself and, well, Mike had already produced himself a spreadsheet to do some when while I was messing around with the earlier ones and since we played I've also done it through a through a spreadsheet as well which is the, the easiest way to do it however I'm going to try and describe how this game works to you and try and get over essentially how we solved the problem Interburbal defines a plane by giving you the x y and z coordinates of three points around the edge of the plane and then asks you to find the coordinates of a specific point inside that plane I decided that the easiest way to think about this was to calculate the three axes separately because since the plane is flat, they're completely independent of each other. Also, since the plane is flat, if you travel a certain distance in a certain direction, it doesn't matter where on the plane you are, your coordinates will change by the same amount. This means that in this case, if I want to move a distance of 37.5% across and 62.5% down, I can calculate the vectors for those on the edges, add them together to get the right answer. So, moving from top left to top right would give me an x-coordinate shift of minus 1. Therefore, moving 37.5% of that would mean a change of minus 0.375. Moving from top left to bottom left would also be minus 1, so my change there would be minus 0.625. Adding these together gives a total change of minus 1, which can be added to the starting point of 1 in the top left to give a position of 0. As a sanity check, we can see that both top right and bottom left have x values of 0, therefore anywhere directly between them on the diagonal must also be 0, and since our target point falls on that line, it gives us a nice confirmation. This sanity check method is actually how I solved the first few puzzles, however it's not accurate enough for the later ones, they require actual proper maths. Now we've got the x element of the target vector, we need to repeat the process for the other two. Horizontally, y goes from 0 to 1, and vertically from 0 to 0, which means it's changed by 0.375 from 0, which makes 0.375. Z shows 0 to 0 and 0 to 1, giving us a 0.625. If I plug these numbers into the, uh, into the answer field, and then hit submit attempt, then the game will congratulate me and give me the reward. In this case, 100 machine learning data and a slightly snarky comment. The system gives you various numbers of attempts depending on how hard the, uh, the the challenge is. So as you get further on into the game, the number of attempts you're offered goes goes down to make it again to make it harder and to make sure you're not just guessing. Although once you get beyond the first sort of few, you, guessing isn't really going to work very well. Notably, when you put your answer in, it shows you exactly where that point lands, so you can tell how accurate you've been. Now, because I did the maths here, we can tell I'm sp absolutely spot on there. But when I first did this, because I was I was sort of guessing a little bit, I was saying, well, that's about point that that's about a third, and that this one was about two thirds. So I actually tried with 0.3 and 0.7. And if I submit that one, you can see it's still inside the square. So I knew my, because I knew my approximations were going to be accurate enough, but it's not going to put it exactly in the middle. So I still did get the uh, machine learning data from this but it's not quite as accurate as doing as doing it properly and doing the maths. If you'd like a copy of the spreadsheet I created to, uh, to solve this problem, then come along and ask in the supporter section on the Discord and I'll make it available. To be honest, that's going to take out a lot of the fun of doing the challenge, so I under will completely understand if you'd rather do it yourself. In fact, I would encourage you to do it yourself, but, uh, but I'll make it available if you're interested. Now, throughout the rest of the game, as I say, the, the uh, challenges get harder and harder, the numbers get more and more obscure, and the grid gets bigger and bigger. However, the prizes do get bigger and bigger as well to compensate. So you get 100 significant data on level 3, then a Spidertron, Efficiency Module 9, Speed Module 9, Productivity Module 9, uh, Wide Area Beacons, Naquium Processors, and eventually some Arcospheres for solving the very last one. By the way, you can also copy and paste straight out of Factorio into your spreadsheet. So if you select these numbers and press Control c you can then go and press Control v in a spreadsheet, and it will happily drop them in there uh, and allowing you to work, work out the answers. And once you've done that, you can then copy your answers back back from your spreadsheet into into the game 
with a, again with a copy paste, and that that work absolutely fine. So it's, it's nice and easy. You don't have to type all of these numbers, so don't yeah. Don't, I, I suggest doing this the easy way if you possibly can. So as I was saying, while I was uh, scratching my head and doing the doing the easy levels by sort of by by dead reckoning approximation and trying to visualize the thing in my head and spinning planes around in my brain, which could very quickly took cause it to turn to cheese. Uh, Mike produced a spreadsheet in the same time, probably fairly similar to the one I've made, uh, and and rattled through some of the harder ones as well. And we thought that was fair enough. It, it, designing a spreadsheet like that would not make particularly good stream content, so I was very happy to leave that up to him. So that meant we were then able to claim all of the prizes from here, jump back in the spaceship, and then head back over to, to go back into the real world and start looking at other puzzles as well. So we climbed back in the Caladrian and set course for Fenestra because there were some other things we wanted to look at over there. And this is going to be the second spoilery part of the video. I'm going to have a bit of a look at the um, at the, some of the archaeological victory puzzles that we've been play messing around with. Uh, so if you were, if, again, if you want to do that yourself and would rather not see the, uh, see the spoilers that I'm going to be talking about, then you'll want to skip forward to about 15 minutes and 6 seconds, where, where normal service will be resumed. On our way back from Anathema, we stopped off briefly in Fenestra because we were aware we had a load of the stuff we needed to get, do a little bit more progress in the Stargate puzzle. Uh, so we had a, a assistant down here that was asking for some bits and pieces. Things like some Naquium processors, some superconductive cables, some of the advanced batteries and some space pipes. So we just chucked those in. Uh, it needed a, a fair number of each. It was around, around about 100 of each, except the processors, which were about 10, I think. But putting those in, it turned out that wasn't like building a rocket. As soon as we put them in, it immediately gave us this control panel here and also upgraded all of the, uh, the points around the edge of the Stargate to have these, uh, the fluid inputs and outputs here. So that was um, interesting. We're definitely making some progress here. We've assembled the machine a little bit. So we started investigating. Now, the first thing we discovered is the power platform down here has a requirement of 10 gigawatts. Now, we weren't capable of producing that. Our spaceship was only capable of producing, I think, about one gigawatt. And plugging that into it, it did absolutely nothing at all. So I think we're going to have to come out here with some antimatter uh, reactors or maybe the matter-based reactors, something that's going to produce a large amount of power in order to get this running and find out what it can do. We considered things like having a beam uh, emitter pointing it, pointing over here and trying to produce power that way, uh, but we, we discovered previously that we only get 0.3% of the power uh, making its way over. So to get 10 gigawatts, we'd have to be trying to beam about 3 terawatts, and that's absolutely ridiculous. We're not going to build a beam emitter that powerful. So yes, we'll be coming out here with some antimatter reactors or something like that. And then this has some buttons on it that you can press, and of course I tried pressing them, as you can tell right by over there where it says last user was me, um, and absolutely nothing happened, probably because it doesn't have power. We also noticed that there's some bars on the side here that says anchor, uh, uh, that looks like a thermometer, and some sort of target with various bars that can probably grow. So I'm we're, we're guessing that when we start to feed in the thermofluid into these into these things, we're going to see the temperature over here will, or well, the temperature bar will fill up to say it's been brought down to operating temperature. Target is presumably going to require us to set some sort of location we want to go to. Maybe we press maybe we press the button here in the middle and it'll change an icon in here, and then we can push the arrows and it'll shift it around. I don't know, but I think this is going to. I, I still believe this is going to uh, link into all the things we've been seeing over here in the Informatron with the uh, with the the star mappings and using these. And Mike thinks that we're going to be doing a similar thing that we were doing with the interburbulator and adding together some of these numbers, uh, trying to get or trying to turn these coordinates into these numbers and link them with the numbers we've seen in the uh, uh, down here because we've got some numbers along here that show again the same sort of coordinate system. So if we can get so potentially if we can use if we can use the um, the symbols that we found through the star mapping to get us the coordinates that will match the logs from the spaceship. Maybe that will be able to take us back to where we want to go to. We can see here, for example, the uh, Thyrus Gate 17 is, uh, project is pointed at the projection vector, da, 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 which is the Wooby Galaxy Fenestra, the anomaly. So this is where the ship uh, tried. This is what this presumably is the coordinates of where we are right now in Fenestra. However, there are no other different vectors mentioned in here. So perhaps if we do the if we, if we do the, the the negative of that, then that vector will be a vector in the opposite direction. Will take us back to where we started from. It's hard to know. Uh, we're going to have to do a bit of playing around with this and see where we can go, see what we can find. But at the moment, it's it's, it's a mystery, and that's the whole point of it. I did notice that these uh, thermofluid pipes over here are both linked, are both labelled as inputs and outputs. So it did occur to me, in, with some amusement, to wonder what what if this is going to take in warm thermofluid and then produce super chilled thermofluid as a byproduct. That would be amusing. It seems unlikely because there isn't an easy way to convert the other way, other than you know doing science with it. But I, sus I suspect it's going to be put cold in and get warm out, and we're going to have a thermofluid facility over here. But it would be amusing if it was the other way around. The other thing we don't know is how much thermofluid it's going to take. So well, I guess we'll 
will come out with our normal systems, run that and see whether it's enough. And if not, we can always expand it out a bit and see how things go. So this is going to be fun. We're going to be investigating this quite a lot over the next few streams. So make sure you come along for those because it's going to be very interesting. Right, and now we shall resume normal service where we shall stop talking about spoilers and get on with just standard factorio building and, and, um, and, and, and moving resources around, logistics and all that sort of fun stuff. And so I spent a, quite a lot of time in the last stream working on the Taras problem. Uh, we have a, a supply of Immersite being produced on Taras, but we're struggling to get enough Immersite over to here. And that was causing all kinds of problems down the road, especially with the Advanced Science 1 packs. And so we've done a bit of improve. We've made a number of improvements to this over here. The most obvious one along here is that Tristan's put in these six uh, strong boxes along here, which gives us a bit of extra storage space for the uh, for the various types of immersite. So you can see here we're passing two belts of plates up, two belts of crystals. They're going into the bottom boxes, being passed up by these inserters, which does slow the throughput down a little bit. But we don't really care. It's giving us more capacity, and that's what we need for this. And each one of these gives us an extra 96 stacks. So between them, we can have an, almost another 300 stacks of each of the. Uh, each of those resources and that's incredibly useful because it means I've now been able to bump up the amount of plate we're requesting here from 15,000 to 30,000 just because we've got extra space for it over here and I've done similarly with the crystals I've only bumped that up to 20,000 because we weren't having the same sort of problems with those we ha had plenty of them and that means that the ships are now trying to bring more over each time they each time they fly and this kind of led to some additional problems so if we look over here on Taras you can see that when when you're making it, um, it when you're making Immersite, you get a lot of junk coming through as well. So yes, we okay, we've got the two belts here bringing in the things we actually want. Although those have been paused at the moment to make sure we don't have a sort of overload problems. Um, but there's also three belts, and these are mostly full, coming in bringing in the trash. Um, and when this train comes in here, well, it can unload the, uh, the rare metals, which we need in very, very large quantities. And it can fill up with all the stuff that we've been bringing down here. But there is an enormous amount of rubbish that we need to get rid of like this before we can start actually shipping out the, the Immersite. And now, it doesn't matter. The exact order doesn't actually matter because they're all produced in equivalent proportions. It's not like if we if we take away the Immersite plates, we can just take that away all the time and not worry about the rubbish. No, we then we'd, we'd, then we'd overload on rubbish. But it means we know that as long as we keep have the trains carry on taking stuff away, then we'll always be able to get through it. The pr problem we're having is that is there's so much sand, and also sand stacks up to 200. So, okay, you can store a lot of it in your, in your warehouses and in your spaceships, but it takes a long time to transfer it around. And so to get around that to an extent, I've upgraded all of these belts across here to purple, and that's our top tier of belts. These these allow 90 items per second, which is pretty good. It's twice as good as the blue belts that are loading this, well, blue and twice as high as the blue belts that are loading the system, only 50% higher than the green belts. But that does mean we get a decent amount of throughput, so when the trains come down, we can fill them up reasonably quickly. At the other end, I've also done some upgrading up here where I've um, changed these to deep space belts, so we're getting a bit more throughput along here, uh, and then we're st still using normal loaders up here, so I've got splitters. So each one of these is, e each each wagon is loading a single deep space belt, but it's then being split into two belts and then uh, passed up here to then be loaded with normal space loaders over here, because that's the, because essentially these loaders are running as fast as they can, even though these belts are only running at 50% capacity. And the reason we're doing this is because the, the deep space loaders are incredibly expensive. And to be honest, this system does seem to be keeping up okay. So it's, it is actually, it is running fast enough. One thing I do want to do, however, although looking at this, it might not be necessary, is to upgrade these inserters along here. At the moment, they are uh, stack filter inserters. I'd like to upgrade them to superior filter inserters. Unfortunately, I can't upgrade them to loaders because you can only whitelist loaders, you can't blacklist them. And these inserters need to be told to unload everything except rare metals. Because that's that rare metals are being brought down to the planet, and lots and lots of different things are being brought up. Now, sure, I could do some shenaniganry with them by having some loaders unloading sand, some doing immersite plates, some doing immersite crystal, some doing uh, sulfur, and having having all of the different things that can be brought up represented in total over them across them all. But this way is this way is working, and it's simpler, and I don't have to worry about all of the different things that are going to be brought up and try and estimate the sort of proportions. But as you can see, we're getting huge amounts of sand pumped out along here, but we are also getting a certain amount of the things we actually want. So the system is working, we are getting stuff passed through a bit quicker than we were before, twice as quick as we were before in fact, and it looks like we've now more or less filled the spaceship, so this one is about ready to depart, and it's got... 15,000 plate and about 15,000 uh, crystal on it as well. So that's been quite useful. We've got a decent amount of stuff in there. We can take it away and, and take it over to Norvis where it can then be used for all kinds of other things as well.
And as I say, I think it is now actually keeping up. I did have some ideas for ways I could improve this if we decided we need to. So the problem is the sheer quantity of stuff that comes through. So in this case, it's things like the amount of sand that we're trying to pump up all of these belts. So I think a good way to fix this will be to put in a second copy of this spaceport uh, over here or wherever. that bring where so, a set, so we can have two ships docked at the same time, two ships loading, and then over in Norbit, have a second place where ships can land, perhaps over here down the end somewhere, or maybe boot Talos across a bit to, uh, to create some extra space, but have two separate ships that are, so the two, sh two systems are running entirely independently of each other, they're just all bringing the resources from the same place to over here, because as I say, it's, it's the loading and unloading of these systems that is our bottleneck, uh, rather than the uh, amount we're able to produce, and so I think that if we do need more, a second ship, and a, or a second spaceport at each end is going to be the way to do it, we already have two ships. The other problem we ran into with the Immersite was the sheer quantity of rare metals that are needed in order to keep the processing running at the, at the speed it, it likes to run at. And so in order to, uh, that we were having, we were finding that the, the two belts of rare metals that were coming in along here, well these two belts are fine, that's more than enough to keep, it, to keep the system supplied. However, having it brought up in this, in this mixed train over here, the train, the train wasn't bringing up enough of it, so I had to go and look into that as well. And down on Norvis, well we have this train that brings those supplies up, and they're brought in along this belt here. And so down here we've got a various different possible ways of loading stuff onto the, in, into the system. Now, there was actually previously, this, this rare metal was flowing in. However, there are so many things along here, there's about four different places along here that require rare metal, that this one purple belt being split between them all was insufficient. And so I've decided. I decided that this wasn't this wasn't good enough. We needed a better supply. And so rather than having one purple belt that comes all the way down this ludicrously long belt from somewhere up here in the bus system, where the uh, where the rare metals are brought into, a better way to sort this would be to have a separate train system that brings in a train's worth of rare metal up to here. And this is right by the elevator. And we can then have a solid purple belt that comes from here. It's fed along this way. Uh, to here and then feeds down here and straight directly into this train in order to make sure we've got enough rare metals being brought in. I thought I'd failed here and we we're just filling the system up constantly with rare metals but no it turns out actually along here we've got the uh, we, this is where we're doing the rare metal starty stoppy blocking system to, to make sure we get the right amount onto the train so actually the system is working fine and I don't need to fix that that's nice I am um, <laughs> task failed successfully it turns out so yes this is bringing in a, a private belt of rare metals that can be brought in at full purple belt speed just for this train just for that system and it's not quite just for Taras I think there are a couple of other places that require rare metals as well although not in quite the same quantities but it is just for the spaceport and that has solved that problem quite nicely if we find that any of the other other areas are, are struggling, like for this, this one for example, which is for the stream area, we could bring in more rare metals here, however this system is currently capable of keeping up, so I don't think it's necessary to bring in another feed from here. Alternatively, we could bring in a second feed from here and put, just put it onto the, uh, onto the bus down wherever it is down here, and get rid of the ludicrously long belt that comes all the way down from the bus stations up here. I don't think there's any real need to do that. Yes, it would save us some belt pieces, but we've got that system set up and it's working quite nicely. So I'm quite happy leaving things as they are at the moment. There is quite a lot of extra capacity coming out of here because we've got four wagons worth here. I didn't bother to plumb this stuff in nicely because I knew I was only going to be taking one purple belt or possibly eventually two purple belts out of here. And so just having these all joined in with splitters like this, it's, it's ugly and horrible and disgusting. But, you know, it works, so why mess around with anything else? If we do end up starting to use more uh, more belts, then I'll put in something a bit neater. I'll have the, the four belts come down to perhaps down to here, put in a four to four balancer, and then have the belts go off to wherever they're needed. But for now, this was fine. This is more than good enough. Because this has essentially stolen one of the rare metal trains, so we have tra tra trains go from rare metal ingot pickup to rare metal drop, I did then create an additional train over in the rare metal uh, smelting facility, which, which is up here. Uh, so we've now got an extra one of these trains, so I've replaced it, presumably with this one or this one. Who knows, they all look exactly the same to me. So this means that the new spaceport system I put in will always steal a train, but it's okay because I've put in an additional one to the, that can compensate for that. And we have a stacker up here where trains can wait. So it, even if the third one or even a fourth one comes up here, it's not going to cause any problems. We've got the capacity here to deal with it. And because all the trains are identical, if we run out down there in the spaceport, this train will go down to, uh, to take its place. And the train that's down there at the moment will come up and, and park in here. So, for example, I couldn't have one that was just doing rare metals to spaceport. That would cause problems because the uh, the train will get stuck in the, in the, in the stacker up here. However, having it be just another one of the rare metal trains. That works absolutely fine. I don't need to worry about any sort of prioritization. It just works. So that was nice and simple to fix it, fit in there. 
We did consider tweaking the system a little bit to process the sand before it leaves uh, before it leaves Taras and bring it over here and then and, and, and in a different form, which might make it easier to transport. So you can see at the moment we've got quite a lot of it flowing through, and then most of it seems to flow down here. Although at the moment it's not to be so, but it's but that's being turned into glass. So we could potentially turn it into glass, but then we'd have to worry about pyroflux as well. And we don't have any vulcanite out there. We have a little bit of pyroflux coming from core processing, but not a great deal. So I don't really want to do that. And also sometimes we're turning sand over here, we're turning it into silicon. So then we'd be trying to balance how much glass versus how much silicon to bring over and also worrying about other things like um, how do we feel about the productivity bonuses that you get from doing things like the, uh, the, the, the smelting it or the cooking it with vulcanite. And how do we feel about, and how, are the, how do the stack sizes compare? So using this recipe, for example, turns 32 sand into 24 glass, which is an improvement, but would still be quite a lot of stuff to pass through. If we use the basic recipe, then we're turning 16 sand into 8 glass, so we're halving the size of it. But I think glass has half the stack size, so we'd have the same number of stacks of stuff being brought over, but it would it would admittedly speed up the loading and unloading because it would be, because that's an, uh, fewer items. But in the end, we decided the complexity was meant that this probably isn't worth doing. If we do if we do discover that we're, we're not able to bring enough sand over with the system we've got at the moment, then the way to fix it is going to be with more more loading and unloading infrastructure, so two spaceports basically, rather than trying to process it first, because I think that would just get a little bit too complicated and would cause problems and, and, and keeping everything balanced over here. Having done all that though, I am quietly confident that we, well, we've certainly made an enormous improvement. Hopefully we've made enough of an improvement that we now have sufficient immersi immersite and immersium. And over here you can see that we have quite a bit. If we look at if we look at the stats here, you can see that we have 35,000 plate and 25 27,000 crystal. Now the train isn't here at the moment, and that means there is somewhere that is getting through it. It is being taken away and being used at a at a rate of some sort. However, the um, the buffer is quite significant and we also have quite a bit buffered in the spaceship that we're now trying to unload. So I think things look pretty good over here at the moment, and I'm, as I say, I am cautiously optimistic, but I don't want to try, I don't want to jump to conclusions on this because I've been wrong before, and I don't entirely trust it not to just, not to jam up at some point. But we shall keep an eye on it and see how things go. Down on Terrace, I even put in that little buffer for the uh, rare metals that I was talking about. So down here, you can see that we're feeding the rare, the raw rare metals are being filtered out as they come along here, out of the core crushing. We can then store up to a, up to a chest's worth of them before they can, then, and before they're then passed on up to the machine up here, which will then cook them into the rare metals. And that's just because it felt silly to be shipping raw rare metals away from Terrace and then shipping cooked rare metals back. Now, technically, it is slightly more efficient because the recipes we're using over on Norvis are more efficient than the ones that we're using here. This is just cooking it in a furnace, but. I don't think we really care. We've got enough of it. It's 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 it, it's a little bit silly to ship it off to ship it back just to get that little bit of extra efficiency. I don't think it's worth it. So we're just going to be cooking it up here. You can also see that the uh, the, the production has now completely stopped over here. We're not making the uh, the plates or the crystals. And if we look over here. Yeah, you can see that most most of the trash has also run out. We're just doing a little bit of refilling from um, the systems over here. That, that is, this is our emergency backup system because this is running at a lower efficiency level or lower productivity level. So we only run this area when the other one can't keep up. And so we're just topping up with a little bit of sand over here. But basically, the system has now stopped. We've got enough immersite and immersium in the in the system now that we're not we're not trying to produce it. We're not trying to feed it through. The system seems to be happy, and that's quite impressive. So. As I say, things are looking pretty good over here. I did have to put some additional solar into orbit around here, so I flew over with Tristan's ship because it was conveniently uh, loaded up with large quantities of solar panel and, and scaffolding, and I put in another 50% on what we had before. So we had four rover ports worth off solar before, we've now got an extra two over here, so we've now got six, so an extra 50%, because I noticed we were we were struggling a little, struggling a little bit with power generation. You can see some you can see some flat tops in, I think, if we look I'm pretty sure I saw some flat tops in the generation. I think it was probably across here because we weren't producing quite enough power. So now we've now got an extra decent amount up off the top there and we should be okay. And I think that brings us rather nicely to the end of this episode. So, as ever, thank you very much for watching. I hope you've enjoyed it. Uh, and w whether you w whether you watch the spoiler parts or not, <laughs> tomorrow's video will not be spoilery. It will just be talking... Well, it'll be, t it'll be a little bit spoilery about Deep Space Science 4. We'll be talking about that. But it's that's all stuff that you can just find looking in FNEI. It's not really it's not really a puzzle so much as just logistics and dealing with how to play Factorio. So, th yeah, no, no, more, no more spoilers in tomorrow's video. 
So yes, I will be back tomorrow with the uh, the next part of this this update video, so uh, keep you up to date on everything that's going on. And then on Monday, we'll be back again for the usual K2SE stream, uh, carrying on with solving all the sort of things I've been talking about here, keeping an eye on the um, keeping an eye on the MSI production and how everything is going there, just making sure that everything keeps ticking over nicely. That will, however, I'm afraid to say, be the last stream for a little while, because I'm going away on holiday, so there'll be a couple of weeks where there will be no streams before I return on the 15th of April, when the normal schedules will be resumed. So everything will go back to normal then, uh, Monday, Monday and Wednesday streams, weekend videos, and so on. And I'm also afraid to say that because of the holiday, I will almost certainly be missing Wednesday's satisfactory stream. So it's going to be a little while with no streams from me, I'm afraid. But I hope you'll all be, uh, all be around when I come back. So please make sure you're subscribed so you'll see when everything starts back up again. So I'll see you on Monday and then after that, after, when I get back from the holiday. So thank you very much for being around and I'll see you then. Bye bye.